Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Okay. So we're going to continue on, inshallah. We are talking about this new series that we started. We're on the second um, class about it, which is the journey, the soul's journey from the pre-eternal life, uh, from the time before we were even conceived, up through the t uh, all the different stages of the life of the human being until we meet Allah and until one is destined for either the Jannah or Jahannam. And so we are speaking about the second stage, so we're going to continue talking about that today, which is really the most critical one to be aware of, which is the life that we're in right now. So we spoke about the stage of uh, from the time that from the time where we meet Allah in the realm of uh, where Allah asks us to bear witness uh, about His creating us, and uh, when Allah asks every single creation, all of Bani Adam, am I not your Lord? And everybody says, Qalu bala shahidna. Yes, you are our Lord, and we bear witness to that. And it's important to keep reminding ourselves of this because the human being goes on a journey where we forget, where this is lodged, the reality of this meeting with our Lord is lodged deep inside of us. There's different layers to your inner realm, to our inner realm. There is the qalb, the heart, and there is the ruh, the spirit, there is the sir, the secret, there is the sir, a sir, the secret of the secret. Lodged deep inside of the human being is this deep recollection that Allah is our Lord and what we are created to do and the purpose that we have. But as we go throughout our life, especially in this dunya, we get covered, we get layered, all sorts of veils cover us, and we have to work on uncovering these veils to unlock that reality this fitra, this primordial state which exists in order to start to move in the right direction again. The stage in which you do that, that is the dunya, that is the, the life that we are in right now, which is um, the time again that from when you are born until the time that you and I die. This is the stage of accountability as well. So uh, that's what we'll be focusing on, inshallah. Um, and we've already spoken about a few of these stages. We'll recap what we discussed with regards to the stage of youth since um, that's the, the, the stage in which mo someone has the most energy, and then we'll get through the rest, inshallah, today. So just to recap, the youth is from the time that somebody, um, roughly about 14, 15, uh, from the time when someone hits puberty, their accountability begins, until the time where they're about 35 to 40, according to different scholars. So that is known as the stage of youth. It is the stage in which one has the most amount of energy that they can devote to either haram or to obeying Allah. And most people devote their energy to disobeying Allah. And this stage is what he's saying, because uh, the, the idea is, well, it can change later, and I'll, I'll work on myself later, and so on. But this is the age where if somebody devotes their life to Allah and devotes their youth to Allah, they will be set moving forward, inshallah. They will be set moving forward based on the hadith where the Prophet وسلم, tells us that your Lord wonders at somebody who's young, who shows no passions. And another hadith, which the one of those who are under the promise the shade of Allah's throne on the day of judgment is the person who worshipped Allah in their youth. So that's the, in this stage um, that many are in right now. So um, that being said, we spoke about what we should avoid in our youth. There are two or three things, a summary um, of where he said we should focus on. The first is to protect ourselves and get in, the, in a mindset of protecting ourselves from all forms of haram, from all forms of things that are impermissible. This is easier said than done. One has to be aware of their inclinations based on the stage that they're at. When someone is 15 to 25, they have different desires and different hormones that are being activated than when they get into their 30s, let's say. So one has to know which desires trigger me as an individual based on my temperament, based on my upbringing, based on what I've seen growing up, and so on and so forth. And then one must guard themselves against the, these desires. And the entire spiritual path is based on protecting oneself against the main appetites that the human being has. This includes the desire, the sexual desire, which is very, very strong in the, in the phase of youth, as is the desire for fame and power and money and, 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 and so on and so forth. These, these are all desires that the human being has, which can either help you or it can ruin you. One of the, if somebody channels them in the right direction, um, it can be good, but if somebody obeys the desire instead of obeying Allah, it will be that energy rather, not the desire. Um, if someone uses that energy to obey Allah, then that's going to be set them up for success. If someone uses that energy to disobey Allah and to, 
cave into their desires, then they will be setting themselves up um, for a very, very difficult stage. Um, he says, the second thing you and I can do is learn to manage our time. Because youth is very much a stage in which we think we have plenty of time. I have my whole life ahead of me. I have plenty of time. I can make all my mistakes right now and just change later. And so the one who understands that their time is the only thing they've been given, and that if they don't use their time wisely in this stage, it's highly unlikely that they will have the foundation, it's possible, that they will have the foundations to use their time wisely as they get into later stages. And for the one who's traveling a spiritual path, they understand the deep value of time. It's not meant to be wasted, it's not meant to, um, uh, it's, it's only meant to be taken advantage of because it is how we invest in our next life. And the third is to acquire knowledge during this time and start to practice it. It becomes harder and harder and harder to acquire knowledge as one grows older. And it's still very, 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 very critical that one continues on the path of acquiring knowledge as we get older. But when one is young and they're free and they don't have the same level of family responsibilities and they don't have all these different things and, and the, the stress of work has yet to necessarily become as burdensome, they are learning. And most of us, we spend our youth learning yeah, secular knowledge, which is not a problem. But what he's mean, what he means here is use the time to acquire spiritual and sacred knowledge. And so if we're still in that phase of our life, then we need to use our time wisely. And the key moment for the he doesn't mention this here, but it's mentioned in other texts, the key time for the ummah that's blessed, that if someone who takes advantage of it will have gained the most amount of good in their life, inshallah, is the time from Fajr to the early morning. That is the time. This ummah has been blessed in that time. And so the person who recognizes from a young age the importance of going to sleep early, waking up early, staying awake after Fajr, no, no, no matter how difficult that is, using that time to study and to do dhikr and, to, and to, 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 to work on things that will be ways of drawing them near to Allah, they will notice immense barakah in their life. So that's something practical that we can take away, especially in these winter months, which we're still in, where the nights are very long, there's plenty of time to sleep. It's not like you have to wake up at 4 o'clock for Fajr. Fajr is coming in at 6 a.m., 5.55 a.m. roughly. It's, it's very, very doable for someone to sleep, to sleep a good amount of time, start their day, pray the Hajjud, start their day at Fajr, get their coffee in and just start moving, learning, doing paper, whatever they need to do before their work day starts or their school day starts, rather than, than, than just a very, very quick Fajr, go back to sleep, wake up two minutes before we're supposed to be somewhere, quickly get ready, and like that, 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 that way of living will either keep somebody productive and moving in the right direction or keep somebody um, lazy and, and, and moving in the wrong direction. And that's not to say yet for someone who in their youth will say, I don't need to wake up for Fajr because I have plenty of time to do so later. That's also a trick of shaitan. He says, oh, you can do this later right now. Sleep, gotta sleep. No, 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 no. That the, the, the youth is the time to get the ibadah down because it becomes much harder to have the energy when someone gets um, older to take the ibadah as seriously, take the ibadah as seriously. So these are the three. And then the fourth, which is um, important to add in the context that we live in, one must be mindful of the common practices of the age that they live in that can spoil their youth. So every age is different. Every age, meaning every epoch, every um, time, century that somebody lives in, every era rather, that someone lives in, will have different desires, will have different ways of pulling somebody in one direction or another direction. The time, the society, the culture that one lives in, one has to be aware, okay, what are the downfalls of the society that I live in and what is it calling me to that negates my responsibility to Allah? And how do I actively counteract that? So, I mean, the, the Imam was saying this on Friday, Khutbah, right? Like in the time we live in, there is an active uh, uh, focus on trying to, to, to confuse people about their manhood, as an example for the men. They're trying to confuse people about their manhood, about trying to confuse people about what their role and their responsibility actually is in the society that they live in based on what Allah wants from them. So if somebody's aware of that, they will meet, make sure that in the stage they're in, especially in their youth, where they're most susceptible, you usually can't change people's minds when they're 55, 60. If you can, let me know what tricks you're using. Uh, but usually it's pretty difficult. You're usually able to get through to people most when they're younger. 
and they're still, and that's also a beauty in why young people are so hopeful and so in, in, in terms of their, their desire to change the world and in the desire to actually make an impact. If someone, as they get more advanced in age, they might start to think, oh, this, I've been seeing this for decades, it's not going to change. When we're younger, someone has this himma, this hope, but also that means the mind is susceptible to go in different directions, different philosophies, ideologies, and understandings can influence somebody in one direction or another. And so we have to be on guard against that. This is where knowledge will serve as a force field, as a shield against improper ideologies, improper understanding uh, of, of things coming in. So seeking knowledge and then being mindful of what practices are going to mess me up. So in the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, for example, or in the time the surah, the surah, uh, surah al-Kaf, the surah of the cave, everybody was was worshiping idols at their stages of their life, especially when they were um, uh, uh, well, well, at all stages really of their life, idol worship was a big, big component of it. Meaning literally would create a physical idol. They would have their temple, they would go to it, they would worship the idol, they would ask it for things and so on. And so from a young age to their older ages, one had to guard themselves against this sin, this sin of shirk and this sin of thinking that an inanimate object can somehow have divine powers and abilities. In the time that we live in, that's, I mean, I don't see that happening really, at least not here in America. Very, 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 I don't think I've ever met someone who's like made an idol out of stone, put it in front of them and started bowing down to the idol. No, they, they wouldn't do that. What they worship here, a lot of people, they worship science. They worship um, different scientific theories, meaning like the they, atheistic understanding of the world, right? A lot of people just automatically will believe the theory of evolution without ever challenging the, the core uh, fundamentals of it. So these things, they become sati, they become their religion, basically. So that's what they're, but that worship is not outward. It's not visible yet till you talk to them, till you see, till you see what they're teaching in schools and so on. So one must be aware in their youth, in this stage of 15 to 35, of what are the things that could get in my mind, the mind of my children, and I have to counteract them. Same thing with different practices of sin. Different societies throughout different eras have different um, sins that they struggle with. Some uh, societies, there is more of an inclination to doing certain types of drugs or drinking or partying. Others, there is um, finan the financial sins are the big ones, right? Taking out interest-bearing loans and so on. And so on. The different different people, literally depending on the people who we hang out with, how we grew up, they will be impacted by different sins in their youth, and one has to be aware of what those sins are, right? And 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 the sin of luxury, for example, over excessive, exuberant spending on things, it will, not, it will not afflict somebody who has very little money. Their sin might be a different type of sin that they're afflicted. So one has to know, okay, based on where I've been placed in the circumstances I'm in in my life, what sins are most prevalent around me that I need to uh, uh, guard myself against so I don't corrupt my youth. Um, so this is the key, and, and the, the essence of it, uh, or the, the final part of it, is just to not let ourselves get in a state of justification of where we'll change our lives later. The more one can have role models of people who, from a young age, were very living straight, straight upright lives, the easier it will be to say, you know what, that's totally possible. Instead of somebody saying, mm, that's not possible, and again, I'll do it when I'm way, way, way older. It, 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 it is possible. Some of the most resilient people, and they'll like, give our brothers and sisters in Palestine complete, complete, complete comprehensive belief in victory. Some of the most resilient people right now, in terms of their struggle and their resistance against this uh, Zionist occupation, are people in their youth who are young, who are standing up for the Ummah, who are standing up for Islam, and who are, who are exemplifying immense amount of patience and fortitude. So it is possible at a young age. It doesn't have to, to be somebody who's much more advanced. So youth, that's the key. The second is this age of maturity. So now he says, okay, somebody gets past this stage and they get into the stage of maturity. He says, this sees um, where someone will, 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 on the youth, they're on their way up. This is the peak. The peak, meaning the peak of what? Of wisdom and of intelligence. So Ibn al-Jawzi, he says that this stage begins at 35 and ends around 50 in the 50s in the early 50s. So he says here what happens is that one will start to attain if Allah wishes good for them. And again, the precursor to this is if Allah gives it to somebody, and of course if Allah gave them the ability to practice what they needed to practice in their youth, Allah will give them immense wisdom. 
And now in this stage, ideally, repentance and returning to God constantly dominate the quality of this person. And they're, they really want to return to Allah. They know that they have to, and they try to focus as much as possible on constantly turning back to Allah every time they make a mistake, every time they make an error, a slip, they turn back to their Lord. Because that wisdom has become clear. As Allah says in the Quran, and when uh, he attained his prime, we gave him wisdom and strength, and, du- and, and thus do we reward the good. And then uh, in another dua, I believe this is referring to, um, Muhammad, this might be referring to Sayyidina Ismail, um, the son of Rabbi Himal, but I'm not her sure. And until when he attained full strength and reached 40 years, he said, my Lord, inspire me to give thanks for that which you have favored me and my parents and to do good works that are pleasing to you and be gracious to me in the matter of the, 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 of my children, of my seed, of, of those in my loins. Truly, I have turned to you repentant, and truly, I am of those who are from the Muslims, from those who have submitted. So here, Allah is showing, okay, at, there's a certain age where who gives the wisdom and the strength? It's God. God decides, I will just bestow you now with wisdom and with strength, with a certain type of um, of, of unlocking an understanding. We all know when we've been around people who are wise, right? Like there's just some 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 grounding quality about them that the words that they say, the way in which they approach the advice that they give us is just very wise. And they're not going to, to hasten to do things. I was just on the phone with a brother today who's probably in this, uh, and I think he got here in the state of his life. And I was like, we got to get this thing done and, and we should get it. You should just do it tonight. And he was just like, I don't, I don't think I needed some time to just think about it. I'm going to think about it over the weekend. I'm going to take my time. And early next week, I'm going to, it was like a difficult conversation we had to have with someone else. Early next week, I'm going to have a conversation. Like I've had, and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's totally, totally the more mature thing to do. Do not listen to my advice. I'm extremely hasty. Not like your, your approach. Just the way in which you said it was wise. And the, the approach in and of itself, deliberation, is almost always better. There's very few instances unless there's like, some abuse or something crazy going on that where, a deliberate, where being deliberate and calm about things is not good. Usually it's very good to do, right? But that wisdom, it will start to show in this stage. And so it was in this stage where the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam received his prophethood formally. It was at the age of 40. So 40 is a big turning point in the life of the Muslim. A big turning point. It is what... It doesn't cut your life in half, but it kind of is the point at which you, where our phase of accountability from the time where we started being accountable began until the time where we might pass away. So say from 15 until 65, which is the average age of this ummah, according to the Prophet Sallam, it's right around the middle of that, right? So this is the age in which he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, achieved a, uh, he got his revelation, he, he, the revelation formally began. Of course, he had been prepared for prophethood well before this, as Allah had been preparing him, but this is where the formal mantle um, was, was given, the prophetic mission was given. And so he says, at this point, it starts to become clear the direction in, um, uh, the direction in where, where someone's life is headed. So if someone's life is headed towards good, it will start to become pretty clear towards this age. And if someone's life is not headed towards good, which means they can still change, it doesn't mean that the seal, the fate is sealed, but it will also start to show what are the priorities that people have? What are the things that, um, that they talk the most about, that they think the most about? What are the ways in which we live our life and how do we exemplify the prophetic qualities that we should be exemplifying at this age? It should be a serious age. If somebody has lived through Islam and hits the age of 40 and hasn't really woken up to the, real, the reality of life, that's a problem. That's a real problem. Meaning like still caught up in the same sins, making, you know, all sorts of, of jokes all the time, inappropriate jokes, not actually taking life seriously, just all the things that, again, in our society that might actually end up happening or being overly concerned about cosmetics and overly concerned about looks and all sorts of things. And, and they're at the age of 40. It's a problem because age of 40 signifies seriousness. It signifies maturity. And it's ajib that Allah doesn't talk about, he doesn't say we gave them outward qualities. He says we gave them wisdom and strength. Now, strength can be strength from a physical perspective, but we can also understand strength from the perspective of iman and the spiritual perspective at this age, at this turning point. 
So what we seek in our relationship with Allah as we go through these stages of life, it's these qualities of, um, of knowledge, which are the, are the most important. And then wisdom is really how you apply that knowledge. So again, when we're younger, we might learn something and we might just want to do it in the way we think it needs to be done. But as we get older, if we've been learning, hopefully, then we'll start to have the flavor of wisdom to it. Okay, actually, this is not really the right thing to say, even though the book says to say it, you probably shouldn't say it. Why? Because it's not the right time to say it to that person, and it might not be done in the right tone, and it might not be done in the right method, and that's wisdom. It's knowing how to apply something in a way that aligns with the sunnah, not just in a way that looks like the sunnah. It, the inner reality of it is in accordance with the sunnah. And so one starts to gain these um, traits. It's actually why book knowledge without having teachers and without um, seeing these things in practice can actually be dangerous for, 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 for us uh, because one just sees a bunch of black and white rules when there's a lot of gray area uh, in terms of how those rules are applied, especially in the context of that we live in. So he says that um, this is a time where, again, the direction starts to become very, very clear. Uh, Imam Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that when he reached 40, he began to walk with a staff and like, like uh, with, 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 with a uh, tall staff, stick type of, uh, and, and he said when he was questioned about it, he used to say, it's to remind myself that I'm a traveler. That I'm just a traveler. Because we are just travelers in this world. We're not supposed to be here for a long period of time. And usually someone will use that, right? It's like the old version of a hiking stick and someone is using it to remind, to, and the staffs were used for many, many, many point, uh, reasons. There's a lot of utility to them, but to remind myself that I am a traveler. And um, then one of the great uh, scholars, uh, Wahab uh, Ibn Munabih, he said that I have read somewhere that each morning a herald announces from the fourth heaven. So caller announces from the, um, from the fourth heaven that, oh, people of 40, you are a crop whose harvest is near. That's, you are a crop whose harvest is near. So you should be, you're, you're, you're that, that, that everything you've been working towards, the harvest is very close. He said, oh, people of 50, questioning them. What have you sent ahead of you? Have you sent anything ahead of you? What have you sent ahead of you? And what have you kept back? What deeds have you sent forth? And what have you kept back? Oh, people of 60, you have no excuse. You have no excuse. And then reminding them that, um, uh, if, if creatures have this burden of being, we are created, right? Like once you're created, now the responsibility comes. Just that, and so he's reminding them that once you're created, the creatures who are created, they know why they were created, and the hour is getting very close to you, so beware. The hour is what? The day of judgment is not when the end of the world comes. The day of judgment for me and for you is when we die. That's the, that's the, actually the small hour it's mentioned in the narrative. That is the, 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 the small Qiyamah. I mean, because the full day of Qiyamah, for us, our deeds have essentially stopped. There's very few things. There are things we can do as other Gajariya, but there are not that many. Our prayers, our fasts, our zakat, everything we're held accountable to has stopped. So that's when the, the time comes. And he's saying that at these stages, the, the reality has to sink in. The key for us in the time we live in is not to just be doing the same thing in every stage of life. Because nobody in their right mind would just live the same life in their dunya and be doing the same thing that they were doing at age like 17 or 18, and then at age 31 they're doing that, and age 45 they're doing that. Even with regards to most people with regards to their careers or their jobs, they would be dis highly dissatisfied if they had a position when they were at age 25 and they have the same position at age 45. Some people would be content with it. But others, most people is, who are who are in, in, in certain fields would be highly dissatisfied with it. What am I even doing? How come I'm not getting promoted? How come I'm not getting a raise? Why am I? And, 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 and it wouldn't, but for spirituality and for maturity, we have, we usually, most, uh, most people in our society, we don't have the same standard. We might be the same level of spiritually mature, uh, spiritual maturity in our 20s as we are in our 40s. And that goes back to prioritization. So if we are still the same thing what we were doing when we were younger, always socializing, always hanging out, it always needs to be about just finding something to do to fill my time so that I don't have to actually remember the real, and we're still doing that when we're in our 40s, and we're still doing that when we're in our 50s, and we're just filling the time. It's a problem. Wake up call has to happen. 
And then it's even worse if somebody is committing the major sins and they haven't changed. Someone who's still um, uh, drinking and smoking and so on, and they were still doing it when they were young, and they do it as they get older, that's even worse. At least for the person who's young, well, there's no excuse in the Sharia, there's kind of like an understanding, of, okay, maybe at some point they'll stop, but if someone is in their more advanced ages, and they've hit this age of, senior, of, of, of maturity, and it's happening, that's a problem. If we have not hit this stage yet, we need to start praying to Allah that he uses us in the best way possible because we only get one chance in this planet during this state. That's what our goal should be. The Prophet, nobody has had more baraka in their life. He was only given prophethood for 23 years formally. And look at how much impact he had and how many billions of people are going to be under his banner on the Day of Judgment. Other prophets had over 900 years of calling, and they're still in Allah's rank, the highest of ranks, but outward, tof, uh, outward results may have not been necessarily the same. The Prophet ﷺ shows us that this ummah has a lot of blessing if they use the blessing wisely. If they use their blessing, because we're all linked to the Prophet ﷺ, and so we all have the chance to use this, the, the, the special gifts that have been given to him in his ummah properly. The best way to do this also as we get into age is link to people who are linked to him. The ones who are linked to him the most are the Ahlul Bayt Rasulullah Sallallahu the ones who are his direct descendants, of which there are many around right now. Um, Imam Abdullah bin Ali Haddad, the text we're reading, he was one of his great, uh, of his descendants. And he also, the, the land where he's from, the land of Hadramaut in Tarim Yemen, uh, that, or uh, where Tarim Yemen is, is full, it's all scholars of Ahlul Bayt. Mashallah. And so there's there there are people who are many, many, many places, many places around the world, and they're still there, including in America. But when one links to them and says, How am I going to have a lot of love for these these people? And how am I going to have a lot of understanding of what their akhlaq is? If they're implementing Islam, of course, not not just if they have the title but don't implement Islam. Now one starts to have a understanding and a deep spiritual, there's an inward understanding, just like there's an outward understanding. And so linking to people who sat with someone, 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 all the way to the, who sat with the Tabi'in, who sat with the Sahaba, who sat with the Prophet ﷺ himself, that's not going to be the same as somebody who's never done that. It's just, it's not possible because the prophetic inheritance is being passed down by one group of people. And so that's one thing we can do to try to awaken up this inner, um, uh, clear this veil we have that blocks our inner reality. The next one we go to is so so he says this is this is now the age of maturity, uh, and then we get to seniority or advanced age he calls it. So this is from fifty to seventy. At this point, most people they may not ever reach a stage past this because the average of this ummah is from sixty to seventy. The Prophet ﷺ he passed according to most narrations when he was sixty three years of age. So the the and he said that this is going to be the average lifespan of my ummah. So he says, at this point, many times physically, signs of weakness start to show. And the strength that was there, that had peaked, starts to recede outwardly. Doesn't mean inwardly someone doesn't have strong iman and strength. Many of the people that, that are doing the most amount of ibadah are in this age group, usually. But it is, you do get tired more easily, um, right? And it, it, it is not the same level of himma that somebody might have had, aspiration or energy someone had when they were younger. And he said that the Prophet ﷺ, he said in one narration that um, uh, what was this that uh, we'll find the hadith in a second, inshallah. Uh, but the, the ayah in the Quran where Allah says, did we not grant you a life long enough for the one to reflect, for him who reflects to reflect therein? And then the warner and the warner came to you. He said, this verse applies to people who are in this age. That, okay, now the life was long. There's no excuse at this age to say, I didn't have enough time. At 50 to 70, there is no excuse at this point. I didn't have enough time. I didn't get enough chances. There was not, he says that life was long enough to start the reflection and, um, and, and, and to, to, to let it, uh, and, and, and to let it really sink in. And one narration of this hadith, that God has left no excuse for one who he allows to reach 60. There's just no, no, God will not accept 
or just or or in this case that there are no excuses that can be presented before Allah. Again, there are different ages where we can present different excuses. But for someone who's been given this much time, for sure there were times in that 60 years of life where somebody could have used their time maybe differently to do things that were important to rectify their life. This is especially important for those uh, of us who may have missed prayers when we were younger. And as we get older, we, that weight of missing those prayers becomes very serious. As we mentioned in previous um, classes, missed prayers, according to the dominant opinion in the majority of Madahid, have to be made up. Going to Hajj and making sincere toba does not clear the debt one owes to Allah for missed salat. We're not talking about someone who converted to Islam. Someone who was born Muslim at the time that they were puberty, at the time that they were hit puberty, they were Muslim, until whenever they start praying again properly, and they miss prayers, they, they, those prayers one is accountable for. There's a common misconception in the time that we live in, that one, once they start taking Islam seriously, that's the only time that they're accountable for things. Missed prayers and missed zakat and missed fast are not excused in our religion. There, there is no, so now if somebody says, well, I have I know, 10 years of missed prayers. 10 years is a lot, but it's totally possible. I know people have gotten 15 years of missed prayers done gradually. Over 15, over future years, they've gotten 15 past years done just by doing one extra set a day. But one can't just say at this point, I don't have enough energy. I can't make up my missed prayers. One has to have worked hard to say, you know what? If I owed missed zakat, if I owed missed fast, if I owed missed prayers, I took them seriously when the, the himma was there, or I'm going to start taking them seriously at, at this stage because um, time is, uh, is is starting to wrap up for this group of people. And he says it's interesting because the lifespans of the Muslims are the shortest to have ever been. In earlier nations, there were people who lived near or in excess of 1,000 years. And some have said that those people who lived to 1,000 years, that they didn't even hit puberty until they're 80 years old. 80 years old is when their puberty would start. And then after that, they had 920 years of accountability. That's, that's the, 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 the uh, age. We know that Sayyidina Nuh السلام, called his people for 900 to 950 years. He would be making, he was making da'wah to them. That's how patient he was. And they didn't even listen. Arrogance in front of him. They didn't listen. And that's when, that's when he finally, after that time, he prayed to Allah, okay, Allah, ya Allah this isn't going to change. Take care of the situation. And then, you know, obviously in a very intense way, the great flood came. So, he said that it was said that one of the um, sons of Adam alayhi salam, um, or perhaps in future generations, died at age 200, and people felt sorry uh, for them having such a brief life at the age of 200 years. And so this this is this 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 is um, totally a interesting phase that we've been given. Where for this ummah, it's a very short period. So how do we make up for it? This is why he mentions at this stage we were given Layl al Qadr. Laylatul Qadr and many of the other Barakah secrets in our religion, uh, uh, secrets meaning um, blessings that we've been given that kind of unlock significant amount more spiritual blessing in our life, they've been given to this Ummah. So Laylatul Qadr, Khairim, and Alfi Shahr. It is better than 83 years of Ibadah. So if somebody gets just like 10 of these in, right, that's 830 years of Ibadah. And and all it takes is that they have to be in ibadah for a good portion of that night. There's many other ways this ummah has been given um, blessings, right? That our intentions are just making the intention results in a good deed. Following through that with that intention can result in 100 or 700 good deeds or multiplied by many, many, many times over. Um, and so, and, and same thing we were mentioning with the secret of the time that we've been given, where it comes in a narration that my, the morning time, the early morning time is blessed for my ummah. So now already he's saying you'll be able to get a lot done in this time compared to, um, uh, and, and it will unlock barakah for someone that maybe was, you used to take somebody 10 years to unlock in a previous generation. Someone might be able to get it in a week or five or five months, right? Allah is, 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 distributes according to the lifespan that he has given. And so there's still there's still um, risk to distribute. And so Allah can give somebody immense what's called tawfiq, divine assistance in their time, but they have to know to use this time wisely. So he goes on this, this explanation of, um, of this, these days of barakah and these nights of barakah, but just given what this, this, this ummah has been, um, uh, has been, the blessings of this ummah has been given. 
And so he says at this age, now what happens is it's all about reverting to God. The dominant state must be constantly turning to Allah, not focusing on this dunya much at all, focusing on gathering provisions for the life to come, utmost in obedience, kind of letting go of all the things of the dunya that we're still attached to. So if we're, still, if we're in our 60s or 70s, even, even which he's going to say in the next stage, and we're still worried about the stock market and what our 401k looks like, and da, 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 it doesn't even matter. None of that stuff is going to matter because we might die tomorrow. Right? And, and like those types of things, anybody could die tomorrow, but specifically someone in this age group, the messenger وسلم, already said that this is the average life of my ummah, so that a wake up call should come in. Same thing if we're trying to start new businesses and new companies and make new investments and all the things that we very normal for us to do at our age. In, the, in this country, the senator of this state was literally trying to be in the Senate, even though it was very obvious that, that there was almost no life left until like 85 or 80, I'm not sure exactly what age, just, just passed away, 88, just, just every staffer is assisting, and then you're literally on this, you will be on the floor of this corrupt government the institute that, that you're standing up for, on the floor of the Senate until you're about to die. That's not how the Muslim dies. The Muslim does not, is not grasping for power until that age. That's not going to happen. That's not the, the key. And in other instances, people in, our, in, in, in the nation, uh, who are people in our country, maybe who are not Muslim, or people who are Muslim, in their 70s, 80s, lawsuits with every other person, fighting all sorts of people. I mean, look at Trump. He is like 80 years old, and everybody has sued him already. Every other state has sued him. Every other company has sued I mean, just constantly, that, and that's the goal. But you can trick yourself only so much by dyeing your hair and putting injections in your face and whatnot, whatever these people do, to think that you're still young. But it's going to catch up. It's going to catch up. And so the Muslim, they understand, okay, I'm at that phase. And that's why, why learning the texts and learning these things is so important. Because then, you know what? The time hit. I got to change now. I can't. If I'm devoting 20 hours more than I need to to work, and I should probably devote some percentage of that to, to ibadah, I should probably consider doing that. And try, try, now, if I don't regularly pray my five prayers, I got to change. If I don't regularly pray the hajjah and I'm not doing it at this age, I got to change. If I'm not reciting Quran regularly, I got to change. If I'm not giving more in charity or serving, whatever things that somebody will do, there's their, their decisions for the good deeds that they decide to do beyond the fara'id, one starts to take it seriously. And Allah even sent them signs. What are the biggest sign, he says, is white hair. When the hair becomes white, that's the first sign that, okay, you're on your way out. Things are going to change. And then when it becomes fully white, that is the biggest sign, he says. When the hair becomes fully white, that um, uh, as, it, as it comes in one narration, white hair brings with it the suspicion that one's time has come. And it is the banisher of hope. Hope, in this case, not meaning like hope in Allah, but that there's not that much more time left. One should stop thinking, I can't change later. Well, how many more signs are needed? Same thing when the wrinkles start to appear. It becomes very, very clear when the bodily functions start changing. So this is the stage at which all of these things start to happen, where all of these things start to happen. Um, and, and, and he says, do not let Allah burn the light of your white hair, because light, the white hair can signify a nur. It's like a, like, a, like a luminosity with the fire of your sins. Don't let that light be extinguished because of the fire of the sins that we are committing. And so at this age, again, that sign should not be, um, uh, we, we, should be we should be very, very, very attuned um, to this. And at one, in one narration, Allah says, by my eminence and majesty and the need of my creatures for me, I would be too ashamed to torment my, ser my um, uh, 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 servants, my men servants and women servants, delineating both, whose hair has turned white in Islam. And then the Prophet wept and they said, what makes you weep? And he said, I weep because of those before whom Allah is ashamed and who do not feel ashamed before him. And Allah is saying himself, I would be too ashamed to torment them if their hair turned white in Islam. And he said that I am weeping because there are people who Allah is, who is, Allah is, is, is ashamed in front of, but they're not ashamed in front of their Lord. Obviously, ultimately, Allah is, does not, is not ashamed in the way we would think about it literally, but there's this is for, for teaching us, right? And so again, that the Allah is showing the sign. When one is young, the strength is there, the energy is there. As one gets older, things change, physical appearance starts changing. So what about that in the society we live in where everybody wants to hide 
all of that. There's no, rec no appreciation or recognition for the fact that you're not supposed to look the same at 55 as you did at 35. It's not gonna happen. In Jannah, it will happen. Everybody's, the average age will be like 33 or so, but according to some narrations, but it's not, not, in this life, it's not going to happen. So for the people who are in this category, to be aware of the society that we live in, that it's trying to make us, just like it made us forget about the importance of seriousness at, when we were young, it makes us forget about the importance of seriousness when we're older. And it's, this is especially, especially, especially the case for, for, for women in our society where the types of stuff that gets sold is constantly focused on appearance. And this, the, the, all sorts of different ways to spend our money to make ourselves appear younger. But well, what if you're not supposed to appear younger? According to what we're learning, you're supposed to embrace the fact that I'm getting older. And, and that's supposed to remind us. Uh, so if my, hand, my hair was, was whitening, and then I dye my hair every, like, however often it needs to be dyed, well, once or so, and, and now I have just look in the mirror and I'm like, I'm not even looking at me, I'm so young. Hold on a second, that's a lie. It's not true. You're not actually that young. You're actually, your hair is whitening and it's supposed to be a reminder, but I'm covering up the reminder. If my skin is supposed to start getting wrinkly and I'm starting to get bags under my eyes and so on and I just go and I put all sorts of serums and potions and all these other things that are being sold to me and then injections and Botox and fill it all up with... So now I'm gonna think, yeah, yeah, I'm still young, but you're not, it's fake. It's all not real. The reality is actually underneath it. And so by not embracing the reality of things, the or organic way in which, people, which we were created, and by putting so, on, so many things on us that will um, uh, fake us or trick us into thinking this is not actually real, we do ourselves a disservice because we continue to try to do the same um, uh, the same, the, the same things with our with our uh, bodies that we did when we were younger, but it wasn't supposed to be the same. Had it needed, was it? If it was supposed to be the same, Allah would have never allowed for aging to happen. It just wouldn't be the case because Allah doesn't need us to to age. Actually, it could just be if someone always looks like they're you know 33, always and just like look or always looks like they're 25, and then they never age, and then they just to get to 75 or 68 and they pass away. You could just get Allah didn't create it like that. It's why? Because there's a reminder of the stages of life. There's a reminder of the stages of life. So as, as Muslims, we should be the first to counteract all of this stuff that's like trying to trick us into thinking that, the, um, uh, that life is not progressing and that's trying to make us um, freeze in time. Just like, I could just be young again. Just freeze. No, no, just embrace it. We're not going to be young again. Just be old. Just be old and be young hearted. But it's totally okay, but not to, to try and let the trick of shaitan get to us. So he says the white hair is a huge reminder. It's surprising actually how much time he devotes just to hadith about white hair and how much a reminder that is. As a reminder for men, it is impermissible to, 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 to dye your hair black, except for and when your one is a jihad. So this is actually something common one sees often is men dyeing their hair. The only permissibility that's possible is someone who dyes white hair with like a red coloring like a mandy or a saffron, um, but, but black is prohibited um, for one to, to, to dye their hair. And one cannot deceive people about their, about their age. Um, so he just gives that as a reminder actually at the end. So then, and I think we'll have just enough time inshallah for this, one gets, uh, one gets to the age of, decrep he calls it, decrepitude. Just the word itself is like, that's, that's the word, decrepitude. So now, he says, this is from 70 onward. Everything begins to weaken. And Allah says this himself in the Quran, Allah is he who created you out of weakness and then appointed after weakness strength, then after strength appointed weakness and gray hair. And he creates what he will, he is the knower, the able. So weakness, one goes from when you're an infant, a baby, you're completely, completely reliant on your parents, weak. And then a, this period of strength, sets in and the strength has an up and up and then it has one losing the strength right and then one starts to get to the stage where he says weakness starts to kick in again and gray hair starts to come and then Allah says in the Quran that among you there is he who who is brought back to the the translation is the worst time of life so that after knowledge he knows nothing Maybe, maybe commenting on memory loss or the inability to think 
or understand, right? All sorts of diseases that start to come to somebody as they get older. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is how Allah has created us. But it's like a sign that when somebody was young, nothing, we were babies, we didn't maybe know anything, our intellects, we weren't understanding things, right? And then as somebody gets into this late stage of life now, um, dementia can kick in and all sorts of other diseases. They're just called diseases of old age. There's no medical cure for them, right? And um, Alzheimer's can kick in and, and these types of things. So he says, these are known as senility and the loss of one's mental faculties. And these start to kick in. And so there's even a hadith where the Prophet asks Allah, oh Allah, ask for your protection from being brought back to the worst time of life. Or from, from based on this ayah, uh, we would assume. And then another from the evil of senility. Um, and, and so the, there's a physical tribulation that comes at this stage. And actually this is, there's a dua, maybe uh, I hear some of our elders reading, maybe when they're like in their 50s and 60s, they say, oh Allah, take me while I'm, uh, while I'm walking. Or take me what, what, before I'm like deeply reliant on people. Only make me reliant on you, right? Because usually it's very difficult for the human being um, if, if any, if we've ever had to, to see or take care take care of our grandparents or parents when they're really elderly, it's difficult for them to, they need help using the restroom. It's difficult. They don't want to ask for that, but they need the help. So of course one has to help, but it's not something that one wants to seek help for, right? It's, it's a difficult stage, help getting up, help walking, help going up the stairs and so on. It's a very difficult stage of someone's life. So he says, this is the stage at which many people have already passed on from the world, according to the hadith, from 60 to 70, before they even reach this stage. But some will reach this stage. And then they have a diff difficult degree of, of um, suffering. And according to one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, few of my nation, he's there, he was asked, what is the age, the average age of your nation? He said, 60 to 70. Their, their deaths on average will be between this age. And he said, what about those over 70, Ya Rasulullah? He said, few of my nation will reach that age. And then, and then he said, may Allah have mercy on those who are over 70. And then may God have mercy on those who are over 80. And just giving, making dua for them. Because again, this difficult stage um, starts to come in. So there's, there's further commentary that's given. Um, but for the, the, the um, khulasa, the summary of it is that one really needs to take advantage of the strength before they get to this stage. Why is it important that if someone here is 30 or 40 or 50, whatever age someone is at, um, that they understand what happens when we get to this point and we study it because sometimes it's right in front of us and it doesn't make any impact. Like our grandparents might be right in front of us and we're like, yeah, but they're great grandpa, it's my grandma, my dada, it's my cousin, I don't know, I'm mean, only this age, I had plenty of years. It's right in front of us. We don't really see ourselves in that. We don't really, and especially in the society we live in where maybe we're not living in homes, the multi-generational homes like traditionally they used to live in. So we only see people our age. What was the last time someone like called up somebody who was 60 years older than them and was like, hey, you want to have dinner? I go hang out. It's usually we're usually hanging out with the same social circle, with the same group of people. So it's highly unlikely that one is 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 going to um, be aware of these things. I just found that there's somebody, and it was I, I I felt it was a very virtuous quality. Someone I know who's in their like late 20s, and um, someone else I know recently started a nursing home. So she was asking, she was like, hey, can, I know a few people who want to like volunteer in the nursing home and just like visit the, the elderly. And I was like, yeah, I mean, the people there are like, like 101, like hospice care on their way out. They're like, yeah, we just want to visit them. And it was like this person, she had grown up with her grandparents always at home uh, and living with them. And then also saw her grandparents pass away at their house um, like, like, like in, their late, in their late 80s, I believe, uh, 70s and 80s. And so I was talking to my wife after, and she was like, yeah, no, it's, it's clearly a quality that she misses that. She misses actually being around their grandparents and misses being, um, and just, just, just the, the there's, there's some type of, of feeling that someone gets an attachment almost, that, um, that they, they want to go and spend time maybe to remind themselves of their, of their grandparents or for other reasons. But the reason, one of the reasons why I felt that was, I was like, it's such a noble thing to do it's because just visiting somebody who's a lot older will remind somebody, you know what? I'm going to be at this stage at, in life right now, so I better be careful about what I do when I'm younger and how I behave when I'm younger. There's many, many people who wrote books in, throughout history at this age of life, deeply regretful books. 
usually um, uh, the ones, the books that got published, we usually like lead, like male leaders, tyrants, some of them, and they would write about how ashamed they were about how arrogant they used to be when they were young, and now how weak they are, and how they just wish they could go back and treat people nicely. And just the remorse that one that one might have because they're spending a lot of time in bed and a lot of time, or or in, maybe sometimes some folks are immobile. So the reason why it's important for us to reflect on this stage is because we will either die or we'll get to the stage. Those are the two options. Either we'll die before, in which case we gotta live our life straight, or we'll get to the stage where we don't have that many opportunities and we gotta live our life straight. So the path points to one thing, live our life straight and, and as soon as possible. That's like where the, the, the mind has to get to that point and the heart has to get to that point of realization. And um, uh, long life though in obedience of Allah so someone reaching this stage and still obeying Allah is desired in our religion so the best among you are those whose lives are long and whose works are good according to the hadith where they get ample amount of time to do ibadah ample amount of time to turn to Allah to do more to do more work and so on work meaning amal good deeds um, uh, and, and, and so on so as, as one narration says and let none of you wish for death for either you are doing good and thus you'll start to see increases or you're doing wrong right now and you'll have more time uh, to make uh, amends with Allah, to fix your relationship with Him. So don't, don't wish for, for a short life or, or for things just because things are difficult. Yeah, Allah, I don't want to live anymore. No, we should never make that go off. We should always ask Allah, Ya Allah, allow me to live as long as it's good for me. And when it's not good for me, then take me away. But the usual dua we see our teachers make is this dua. Oh Allah, bless us with long life in your ibadah, long life in your ibadah, um, where we where we are able to understand the purposes of each of these stages, um, and and so he goes on to various uh, things that happen then until one finally reaches the point of death, and so uh, we'll probably cover that next time. We want to try to get to it today, but for the sake of time, it's a little bit lengthy, and there's it's a pretty critical stage of, of life to understand is when someone actually is about to leave this world. It's one of the, the most momentous um, uh, events for us to grasp. So we'll want to spend probably the whole class or part of it on it, inshallah. Uh, but just briefly, we'll finish this up. He mentions that many people who lived lives of immense barakah never reached these later stages. So Imam al-Shafi, which is the, one, the great Imam, the one who founded the Shafi Madhab, he died at the age of 54. He said Imam al-Ghazali, the proof of Islam, Hujjah al Islam Imam al-Ghazali, he died at 55. And then he mentions many others um, uh, who, who died amongst the great women and men uh, leaders of this ummah and spiritual pillars of this ummah who died in their 40s or 50s or 60s. It, not, not necessarily that it doesn't necessitate that for one to live a uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Omar also passed away between 60 and 70, radiallahu anhum. That, so it doesn't necessitate that somebody lives uh, a, a significantly long period of life for them to be able to accomplish a lot. He says the key is barakah. The barakah in the time that they have and how they use that time will be the key to unlocking how much they're able to accomplish um, with, the, with the time that they have been given. So he says this last period, decrepitude, usually is on its way, according to most scenarios, they end, someone ends with a fatal illness then. Their life starts to wound, be wound up with some type of illness and then with death. Death can happen without illness. Allah does not need an ex excuse for death to take place. But most of the time, this is what happens. And so, so someone gets into this advanced old age. So to know this and to know that, okay, death is at every door. Either I'm going to reach this age and I will die with some disease, or I'm going to reach this age and my time is going to come and Allah will take me. Or I think I have plenty of time left and the next thing you know, tomorrow, God forbid, someone just passes. It. It's, he said, every door leads to death and leads to the meeting with Allah. So if that's guaranteed, then make use of our life, of our time, of our moments, of our days, of our conversations, of our interactions and as much as possible and use them in the right way. Don't let a day go by where we feel doubtful. Am I committing sin? Like if we know something's wrong, I got to leave that wrong. That's it. Tomorrow I'm leaving it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it because I know I'm going to die the next day I could die. And if you make the intention today to leave a wrong, if we make the intention today, Ya Allah, I don't want to do this thing again. And tomorrow we do die and we never left the wrong in the first place, we'll be, it will be as though we did leave the wrong. Because the intention is what matters. So one, we have to use these moments, hopefully as, as means of 
really reflecting, what am I doing that God would not be happy with when I meet him? And how am I going to change that? And then, inshallah, we set out on that path to change. Uh, so with that, uh, if there's any questions, we'll go ahead and, um, and do them. And I know folks ask online, what book is this? It's The Lives of Man by Imam Abdullah uh, Al-Haddad, The Lives of Man. It's a short book, um, but packed with a lot of good uh, content. Yes? Yeah. You want me to do that one first? Yeah, yeah, really good, good, uh, great question. So the question is, if we missed our salah, um, do we have to try to remember the salah or is doing the nafila and the sunnah prayers enough to make up for that? Um, so the, you do have to try to quantify and measure how much was missed to the best estimate possible. So what someone does is um, someone calculates, okay, I know that I was responsible legally to start praying at age 15. I might have prayed from 15 to 18 most of my prayers, maybe 95% of my prayers, maybe there's a few I didn't pray. But I know for a fact from like age 18 to 28, I was in Jailia. I was not praying, I was messing around, whatever one was doing, maybe they weren't taking their life. Or they say, you know what, I miss Fajr every day, I know it. I never woke up, I miss Dohar because I was at school and I didn't want to pray, whatever else it is. So now one would say, okay, for 10 years, I have to calculate, let's say someone missed Fajr and Dohar, two prayers, Fajr and Dohar, for those entire 10 years. And you estimate and you do a little bit more than what you think, because usually it could be a little bit more. And then you can you literally can create a spreadsheet if you would like. I, I, I know a resource, I can send it to you, the spreadsheet, you can just track it. And then you can say, okay, now I have to just slowly start making it up. And now you have to make the intention for that prayer, not the day that you missed it, like, January 14, 2008. No, you just have to say, I'm making up a fajr from the past. And I'm making qada a fajr. And then you get it, you pray fajr. And you can do it fairly quickly. It doesn't have to be long prayers. You can do the short surahs. It can be quick. But one then would quantify and, and start to make those up. And if it's all of them, then it's all of them. It's all five. Um, if one doesn't remember whether I was praying or not, uh, you take the general understanding and probably wasn't praying. Usually one would remember if we were doing most of our prayers or at least some of them. And then... The sunnah and the nafila prayers, um, they make up for deficiency in the fard prayer, not the fard prayer itself. This is actually a very common question um, that folks have, is does the sunnah and nafila replace the entire prayer? So if I'm praying and the reward for the prayer is this much that I could get, 100%, the vast majority of us are like thinking about something and the next thing, you know, I have to do this tomorrow and I have to do this for work and I have to, what am I going to eat for lunch and blah, blah, whatever thoughts should we have in our head that shaitan might whisper into our mind right when we start salah. So we actually might only achieve 30 or 40% of the reward. The sunnah prayer now helps you get a little bit more and then you do the next sunnah and it just gives you the maximum reward for the prayer. So it makes up for deficiencies or um, mistakes that are not like critical mistakes that someone makes. So if someone makes a big mistake that's not excused, one has to make up the prayer. Um, but like small mistakes one makes in the prayer, and one day they make up for that. So that's why we must do the sunnah nafila. And when those mistakes don't exist, there's just a bunch of extra reward, extra reward, extra reward. But the five prayers do have to be made up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good question. The question is about white hair and someone might get it a lot earlier. So um, what he's speaking to here is like the commonality, the general rule. There could be specific instances, like I know somebody who their hair was fully white at age like 26, fully, right? And a uh, 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 brother. And I mean, it just, I think it ran in the family. It was just genetic. There was, it, there was a face was fully youthful, right? But the hair was fully white. Um, and, and so there's a difference between, let's say, when it's genetic and when it's the commonality. What he's referring to is the commonality. When it comes to someone genetically being predisposed to someone and then like, what do they do about that? 
um, that would be someone you would ask like a specific question in that ace let's case to a scholar who would say okay it's permissible for someone to do this because they got it a lot earlier but in general the white hair it, it is a sign of nur and one of the hadith do mention that don't let the light of your white hair be extinguished by the fire of your sins so it's not that it's a it's a bad sign what it's supposed to be a reminder of is that i'm i'm not at that early youth stage anymore. Things are changing and I'm advancing. And so most of us will gradually, get, most human beings will gradually get white hair. Some in their 20s and then in their 30s and then it really starts to pick up and then in 40s and then at some point it's full white. And then what he's referring to is when it becomes full white, really, really, really take it seriously. So yeah, does that answer? We'll do one here. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you're, so the question is, let's say last Ramadan, if someone missed fasting for a valid legal reason, like travel or something, or sickness, and now Ramadan is about to come, you know, on the lower in Rajab, so in two months until it's Ramadan, you're saying, does someone have to make up before the next Ramadan? Yeah, that's Yeah, so you are obliged actually religiously to make it up as soon as you have the ability to make it up. So it's not even that necessarily waiting till the next Ramadan. Like you gotta try to make it up shawal. Like it's like not really, there's not that much time given. But um, if someone regularly misses that and regularly misses that, all you have to do religiously, and I, um, uh, if anyone has a more detailed answer, otherwise um, Omar, I'll look into it. Uh, one has to do religiously is you have to keep track of it of the fast that I owe, and then at some point you have to make those fasts up, right? So it's similar with the missed prayer, where one technically has to make up the missed prayer as soon as they can, but maybe they'll wait 20 years and they'll never do it, right? And then we might do it a lot later. So then one might reach the stage where they have a lot of fast to make up, but the reason why that's not recommended is because it gets, it's really difficult to make up a lot of fasts, right? Like it's hard. You cannot fast sunnah or nafila fast if you have fard fast to make up. So if somebody has a fast of Ramadan to make up, you cannot fast Muharram or Ashura or um, uh, the fast of Shawal with the intention only of doing the Nafila fast. The intention first has to be that I'm making the Fard fast up, and then some of the scholars permit a secondary intention that I'm doing this 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 uh, this for the sake of the the, day, the noble day that one is fasting on, and hope maybe Allah will give the reward inshallah. But um, if you didn't, let's say someone didn't make it up between Ramadans and they had the ample time, um, that would be usually one should make toba for the fact that they fell short in that. Uh, that one would ask Allah for forgiveness that they would that they fell short in having 330 days of the year and one did not even consider making up those fasts. Uh, it could be different for a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding woman who might have missed the whole Ramadan. And now you're talking 30 fast to make up versus somebody who was sick or traveling for two or three days. And you talk, so so the, the scenarios will kind of vary uh, depending on the, the circumstance. Uh, did you have a follow up to that or separate? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I know one of the things that we don't make it up by the following Ramadan, but then when we do make it up, it's Shaban, Shaban, you mean? Yeah, Shaban. Yeah, Shaban. Yeah. Yeah. So one should one should do their utmost within within their ability to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 
you want me to answer that one first? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, you have farther prayers to make up. Um, is it preferred over Taraweeh? According to two of the Madahib, it is preferred over Taraweeh. And in fact, according to one of them, it's obligatory. You cannot pray any Sunnah prayer if you still owe a farther prayer. According to other Madahib, like the Hanafi school, um, you should go to as much of the Taraweeh as you can and then use the rest in makeup. And then other madahib may permit you to make an intention during taraweeh, if you're doing two rakat, two rakat, to use that for makeup fajr, for, for fajr makeup. So there's a difference between the, the schools. Um, I generally, what I've been taught and try to prescribe to is to take the makeups more seriously than the sunnah prayers. And so if, let's say you can come for taraweeh, maybe you come for eight, and then you go home and you do 12 makeups. Right, and so now you're still doing 20 prayers at night, or how many ever someone wants to do even more than 20. The Malikis used to pray 36 traditionally, so one might do 40 extra prayers, whatever else it is. But they're they're using the time. Others they pray their fard prayer and then they just get straight to the makeups and all that. They don't use any time for anything else. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the, the question is about dual intentions for fasts, such as the fast, the 10 days of the Hijja. Um, so because those are not obligatory fasts, different madahib had different opinions on whether a dual intention is permitted. Some said, no, nope, you can only make the intention for the singular sunnah not the fast that it is, and that's it. Others said, no, you can make both intentions, and the primary intention is for the fard prayer, or for the fard fast that you missed, and then you make the secondary intention that I'm doing it during these virtuous days with the hope that Allah will give me the reward of, of, uh, of these virtuous days. But what you would not do is delay the makeup to those days just so that you could get the extra reward. What you would do is try to make it up sooner. And if you weren't able to find the himma, but now everybody in your house is waking up for support, you're like, okay, now i got to do it. Now you, you know, um, would kind of make that dual intention. So it is permitted. This is where, alhamdulillah, there's multiple madahib in Islam and different scholars have differing interpretations um, that allow for room. Yeah. Uh, so which one is it that said you cannot? Uh, that you can double up. Um, I believe both the Shafi and the Maliki school permit doubling up and the Hanafis are usually not as uh, okay with it. Yeah. Uh, Sidious Maniel, is that the Shafi school usually permits the dual attentions from my understanding in both the prayer and the fast? Okay, come to that. Yeah, we can follow up on that. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so the Hanafi say that you can that um, uh, the first, the prayer is the prayer, the intention of the Imam is the only intention that you can have, so that's what Hanafi school says, and they say that you actually would do taraweeh and you have to find time to do your makeups. They would they would not say that one is prioritized um, immediately over the other, but, they, but the makeups still have a significant responsibility. The Shafi school, from my understanding, and I have not studied Shafi fit in detail, but from the few opinions that we've gotten, that you can make the dual intention, according to one of the opinions, in the prayer, for the makeup, for Fajr, let's say, for Taraweeh, and um, that you need to prioritize missed prayers over makeup prayers. And I believe the Maliki school, while it doesn't permit the dual intention, it does basically say you have to do the makeups before anything else. Um, but even within the schools, there's many opinions that came in about, so Allah knows best, we can check on that for sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Others? Nothing? Just your side? Uh, yeah, Omar, go ahead. No, no, no. So if you pray the Qada that day, let's say somebody misses Fajr and wakes up at 8.30 a.m. and they pray Fajr, 
but you did your qada then. There's not, there's not like a makeup calculation one has to do. Same thing if somebody misses dhuhr, they make it up that day or that week. If you don't have to do any calculus, what we're referring to is like 10 years ago, I missed a bunch of prayers. Now I got to calculate which ones I missed. Yeah. Uh, question is. How do you reconcile medical innovation that is aiming to curb many of the natural processes of senescence, I believe you mean, kind of old age? I'm not talking about Botox fillers to hide our healing appearances. If someone, if you could qualify what you mean by that, um, by what innovation you're referring to, like that, that, that can curb the natural processes of old age, that would be helpful. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of too many of them. And, and then there's a question. In general, there's a few questions about um, appearances and what is permissible and what's not. The, the general understanding that we should have as Muslims is we should really, really, really not try to change our appearance. There's actually an ayah in the Quran where Allah talks about how it's shaitan who inspires them to change themselves from, their, from the perspective of their appearance. You are the way Allah created you. We take care of ourselves. We maintain ourselves. We look dignified to the best degree possible. We try to, you know, there's, there's, we have to groom ourselves and so on. From that perspective, one has to make sure they do that. But physical alteration of the human body and the human experience, especially with the intention, that's the, like any unrighteous intention. So the intention of, of, of just doing it so one can appear beautiful for longer for the sake of people usually, right, as an example, or, or for any other reason, one should be extremely careful to do that because you're now getting into a gray area where you are actually trying to tell God that you naturally are allowing for something to happen and I'm going to find a way to stop that thing from happening. Um, and this, this, this does not apply to one taking care of themselves, drinking a lot of water, uh, and making sure they get enough sleep. We're talking about physical altercation, uh, alteration, plastic surgery, Botox, all these sorts of things. So since there's a few questions on that, we'll just say kind of comprehensively, um, we should keep that in mind. What did, when we, was a question, when we struggle with our faith, what is the best reminder to bring us back from experience? Um, it's a good question. So the first thing that when we struggle with our faith, we should have a habit of opening up the Quran as quickly as possible because the Quran is the word direct, the message directly from Allah actually to every one of us individually. It's not a message that's just revealed and meant to be only um, uh, kind of accessed from different periods of time. It's sent to us individually. So we should open it up and say, what is Allah trying to tell me? And that in and of itself, will, will, there will be a message in the ayah that you read for you specifically that will be for the exact faith challenge that you are going through tried and tested, I'm sure many people in this room when we are facing that, we open it up and Allah is telling us something. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that one should immediately try to um, sit and either pray if they're able to pray or make dua, whatever they're able to do to say, Ya Allah, I'm struggling right now. I just want to talk to you. So open up that door of communication. Ultimately, the goal of faith is so that you can have a conversation with your Lord regularly. That's one of the key points of faith. You believe in him, you interact with him, and you see him in all your interactions. And so in that, when one starts to have that conversation, it automatically, um, the huzn, the, the heaviness and the struggle one is feeling, it might start to calm down a little bit because now you are letting your Lord in. He's already always been there and he's aware of what's going on, but you are allowing for him to come. So those two things um, that, that you know, we would recommend. And then the follow-up, uh, medical innovations that curb diseases of old age, such as Alzheimer's or a drug that could prolong the life of individual cells, which is in research currently. Yeah, so the second one, uh, I, I'm, I, I don't know, you would want to ask like a mufti who's qualified and who understands um, the specific bioethics spiritually around that. Uh, the first one, if you're trying to curb diseases, there's nothing wrong for the most part with that, right? So you, uh, the senility that kicks in and now one is taking a medicine of some sort that is going to help somebody not have all the memory loss, khair, as long as there's nothing haram in the medicine that's going to hurt you in another way, Allah knows best, and I would again check with the mufti on this, um, you would usually would be fine with most of those medicines. Where it starts to get tricky is artificial things that one does solely not to change your intellectual capacity, but to change your um, 
uh, physical physical appearance uh, and, 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 and those types of things. So that's at least from what we've understood, but Allah knows best, hopefully that helps. Um, there's another question. When relatives trouble us, what do we have to do? Yeah, so Allah, so first thing you have to remember, Allah said, وَجَعَنَّا بَعْضَكُمْ بَعْضَ فِتْنَةً Will you not be patient? We have created some of you as a test for others. Will you not be patient? That's the ayah all of us should remember when we are interacting with relatives because the nature of family is it was going to trouble you. I don't know if I've ever met anybody who's never had any problem with a family member. If you're going to have a problem with a family member, be that somebody who's Muslim or non-Muslim, practicing, not practicing, the family, the, the, the issue will come up. You remember that. The second is you remember the Prophet ﷺ struggled the most with his relatives. They gave him the hardest time. His uncles persecuted him, persecuted him. They had major issues with him and they gave him the most amount of difficulty. You have a few routes. One is you internally try to exemplify as much sabr, patience, and ihsan in your approach to them. So try to try to be patient and, 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 and not overly um, responsive in a bad way with what they say. If the trouble is getting so difficult, it's bearing on you, or it's getting to the point of like verbally problematic, you try to have a strict conversation with them where you draw a barrier, you draw a line, you say, look, you can't speak to me like that, that's not respectful. We really need to make sure we have proper communication and we, we, we kind of fix this. And then you're not obliged to see people who create a lot of problems for you all the time. And you, can just, you just have to maintain enough of a relationship that you're not cutting them off but not one in which you're imposing a, a lot of difficulty for you. But if it's like once every couple of months you're seeing them and they're creating problems, that's part of patience. Life is going to have to, we're going to have to be patient with each other. And the Prophet said in one, I believe it's a hadith in one, in one narration, that it's more virtuous to be with the people and have to deal with the ups and downs of interacting with people than it is to just seclude oneself and, you know, kind of go kick it in a... In, in the mountain or something somewhere and, and not be, um, but the people used to do that, they live a life of seclusion and it's not, nothing wrong with that, but it's better to be with the people and to interact with them and to go through the ups and downs of, um, of difficulty. And the follow-up, uh, what if the person is violent? I mean, yeah, that's a whole different story, right? And at that point, if someone starts to get abusive or violent, um, this, is, this is more, I would take this to the appropriate um, uh, kind of solution or center that can offer assistance, but because uh, these days, you know, calling the police is probably not the right move, so they usually are less helpful than, than more, but you would need to find someone to intervene in that instant. There's no place for violence and abuse in our religion, bar none, so you can't allow for that to happen. If it's like a older cousin or something who's pushing you and violent a lot more, and, and it's not necessarily like a domestic abuse situation, you want to make sure you're bringing that up to someone elder in the gathering and saying, hey, look, like this is really hurting me or like creating a lot of problems for us. Um, we need to do something about it. So the key is that one has to not tolerate the injustice when it's not like just small personality issues. When physical problems get involved or there's emotional abuse or anything of the sort, one has to take the precautions either directly with people involved there or with some other you know, external parties to assist and to remove that um, or to confront the person properly with others to back you up and to say, this is wrong what you're doing and you need, you need to stop, right? Um, because sometimes people think they're just, if they're like roughhousing, they think they're just joking, but it actually might seriously be hurting somebody or just inappropriate for them to be doing. Yeah. Okay, I think that's, uh, yes, go ahead. Great question. The question was around, um, we mentioned the importance of learning and learning with the teacher versus just reading on our own. Um, and, and, and so what's the balance uh, basically around that? And how do we go around, uh, how do we go about finding someone to, to help us with this? The key is the connection, not the physical amount of time that you spend with them. So what we mean here, there's various types of teachers that have been laid out in our, in our religion. Um, we should, try to have somebody who can give us a sense of what books should we read as we're trying to progress along the path. That's sufficient, and then you have, if you can ideally ask them a question every now and then about the book, and if they've studied it with the teacher, or they've studied it you know, sufficiently, then that would be very good in the time we live in. Traditionally, 
that would be difficult to accept. People would like, no, you gotta go and sit and learn with somebody who has bisnad and has chain. And, 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 but we're just living in a time where that might be difficult. One could also say that you would re review the book online with like an online class or the class on YouTube that was taught, which, which there's thousands of them on the law online now, um, where at least you see there's a curriculum that was followed and there's questions and answers that were asked that you could you know, help, help you process um, whatever questions might come up. Uh, if somebody can do that, then reading on your own with kind of like a guided reading would be very good. If not, then at least the bare minimum, everyone still has to read on their own. They're far the aim, they're basics. It's usually when you get into a little bit more intermediate or advanced topics where reading might confuse somebody if they don't have someone to ask questions to. The second is um, that, and the person, by the way, who you ask questions to doesn't have to be physically there. Uh, so uh, uh, people have teachers that are international. They would WhatsApp them questions now and you ask to answer the question and they have a Zoom call with them and it's, it's sufficient, right? It's not, it doesn't have to be like someone sits with them. Second question on how does one go about finding a teacher, right? And um, the key is one makes a strong intention to Allah, Ya Allah, I want to learn. Please give me the ability to, 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 to learn with someone and to access somebody. And they say that literally Allah will bring someone to your doorstep. According to them, there like it will be su Allah will bring someone in your life when you make that intention sincerely, and that person will be a means of assistance. And I know many people who that's happened to, and they had no idea that it was like right there, the person next to them. They might have grown up around that person, and the person they never knew until they made that intention. And now some interaction happened between them and that person that made it clear: oh, this person is a person of immense knowledge and connection. And then they started guiding them and sitting with them and helping them. We're in the Bay Area, alhamdulillah, there's ample amounts of people like this. Many people who are people of knowledge, who are people of learning, who've sat with some great shiul, sat with the likes of Imam Zaid and others, the, many of the faculty at Zaytuna have immense knowledge. And you don't necessarily sit with them, but you sit with somebody who's sat with them, who's taught, who's, and you just, you just need kind of an older brother, older sister type of figure to help along the path. But that intention, once someone makes it, it will be clear for the rare people it's even been mentioned in some of the books, they make a sincere intention, they beg Allah, and they beg Allah, and they beg Allah, and then, um, you know, they, that somebody might have a, a dream or something like that, which will, might indicate to somebody, this is who you should go to to learn. But the key is one starts with the intention. Yeah. Okay. Uh, apologies, it's getting late. Uh, oh, there's another question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, back to prayer, do you you make the intention to make to make a prayer and you sleep through it. Uh, Fajr, you still get the sin of missing the prayer. Uh, it depends how sincerely you follow through on your intention. So, like, if you know that you sleep, like you snooze a lot, and you set like two alarms. It's usually not excusable. If you set like 12 alarms and you did your Siri, your iPhone alarm, and you told Alexa to set an alarm, and then you did this alarm, you did all the alarms, and you told your, your wife to wake you up, or you called your brother and you're like, make sure to wake me up for Fajr, you did whatever you could. Sincerely for the sake of Allah, and you slept on time, not sleeping at like 3 a.m. and expecting to wake up at 6, right? You really, and now you miss it? Okay, you hope that inshallah it's excused. But usually there's very little, there are few excuses. There are excuses for someone who sleeps, um, who just literally, like, sincerely sleeps through something with, and they tried their best, right? And they don't even remember when they wake up that they snooze all the time. But then there's, the excuse is not the same for somebody who wakes up, they are very aware that they're awake, they press snooze, and then the next thing you know, it's 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 eight o'clock and they slept through. So um, this is what's called sidqa tawajjo, truthfulness in our aspiration, in our direction of what we're trying to do comes in. How truthful is someone in that intention? And if somebody does all of the prerequisites and they feel a remorse when they wake up, like, Astaghfirullah, I really, really am trying so hard to keep doing this, please help me. Then you, we hope, inshallah, that there is that, that forgiveness that's granted. Um, but if it just becomes a pattern, it's happening every day, we're not really trying too hard, we're just kind of hoping that it'll work out, uh, then one's intention was not as sincere as the, the other case, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Yes, question. A little hard to hear. Could you?
yeah, Hamdul, the, the comment was if one starts to do um, usually any type of exercise, specifically cardio, and then drinking ample amounts of water actually also um, will help somebody uh, just get the right amount of sleep that they need. And it's usually easier for them to, to wake up in the morning. And, and as well as du'as that one needs to read before they sleep, make sure not to see any sins at all right before bed. Like if we're scrolling on Instagram right before, everybody will have problematic things come up in their Instagram feed. Put it away. Don't let like, look at that before bed. All the things you can do to protect your spiritual state so you sleep in like a saintly state and a protected state so that you can be woken up, right? Some people are woken up, right? They, they, they won't even set the alarm and they could be wake up. Um, and so, so you want to try to do that and protect yourself. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So if there's anyone else online, we'll try to get to it next week. Um, because it's getting a little bit late. Alhamdulillah, so we'll end with a, with a dua. Oh, uh, I will be traveling next week, uh, so we will not have class, uh, inshallah. So the following week, we will do our absolute best to resume. Um, like 95% sure we'll be good to resume the following week. Uh, if, 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 uh, but just look out for a message in the WhatsApp. Allah, we ask you, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Allah, that you pour your mercy, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, upon our brothers and sisters in Palestine, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, while we are sitting here and while we are benefiting from security and from ease and from comfort and from the ability to, to sit and, and be in a state of security, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, our brothers and sisters continue to suffer immensely, Ya Rabbil Alameen, we are suffering, Ya Allah, and many people are ignoring them, but we know that you are not ignoring them, we ask Ya Allah that you give assistance and that you give madad, and that you give protection, and that you give swift relief and swift aid to our brothers and sisters in Gaza, Ya Rabbi Alameen. We ask that you assist the children, we ask that you assist the parents, we ask that you assist the, the, the elderly, we ask that you assist the men, and that you assist the women, and that you assist all of those people, Ya Rabbi Alameen, in the region, Ya Allah. There are many who are continuing to be and serve you, and we're providing medical treatment, we're providing journalistic coverage, and we're doing all sorts of things while they're in under immense, immense, immense adversity, and while they're being targeted, their lives are being targeted, we turn to you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, this is the Ummah of your beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Allah, and you love him and you love this Ummah, Ya Allah, we ask Ya Allah that you give relief to them, Ya Allah, that you give relief to these people, that you accept them and that you give them tawakul and that you give them patience, Ya Allah, there are those, Ya Allah, who are, who are suffering in the cold and who don't have water to drink and who don't have food to eat and who do not have a place to live properly, Ya Allah, who are living in tents, who are suffering immensely, Ya Allah, we ask that you clothe them and that you feed them and that you give them warmth and that you give them comfort and that you give them tawakkul and that you give them patience, Ya Allah, I mean, we ask that you help this ummah, Ya Allah, through this immense adversity and give relief to this ummah and that you give assistance to this ummah and that you give them supper and that you give them immense high stations for this difficulty, Ya Rabbi Alameen, we ask that you accept all of those who have passed away as the highest stations of Shaheed, that you accept them as Shahada, that you give them the highest ranks of martyrdom, Ya Rabbi Alameen, Ya Alameen, Ya Qawiyyul, Ya Mateen, we ask that those who are trying to serve you in your cause and who are resisting this oppression, Ya Allah, that you make their feet firm, Rabbana Afriqa, Ya Nasabran, Wa Thabbid Laqadama, Ya Mursunna, that Qawm al make their feet firm, make their hearts firm, and give them victory over the disbelievers, Ya Allah, give the Muslims victory over the Kuffar, Ya Allah, give the Muslims victory over the Shi'ateen, Ya Allah, give the Muslims victory over these Shi'ateen and over these evil people who are trying to oppress and who continue to oppress and all of those who assist in the oppression, who assist in the evil, and who assist in the atrocities, we ask that you take them to account in the best of ways, Ya Qabil, Ya Mateen, Ya Qahar, we ask, Ya Rabbi Alameen, Ya Rabbi Alameen, that you hold these people to account in this life and in the deepest, in the deepest ways in the next life, Ya Allah, we ask that you wrap this Ummah with your mercy, Ya Allah, we ask that you give us the ability while we are in safety and security and soaking and swimming and basking in blessings that you allow us to take our lives seriously and that you allow us to work towards you and that you allow us to serve you properly and that you allow us to be people of shukr and people of iman and people of dhikr and people of ithqan, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and let us do whatever it is that you want us to do to serve you. We ask that you protect us and our children and our family and our loved ones and our parents and that you grant them the highest of stations of Jannah and that you allow for us and our generations to come to be protected from the difficulties of the end of times and protected from the kufr of the times we are living in and the end of times, Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you protect us from the fitna and the fitna of the 
Masih al-Dajjal and the Fitan of the End of Times, and we ask that you allow us to be connected to the Prophet and to you always, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you give us a deep connection to you, Ya Allah. We ask you for everything good. The Prophet asks for, and we ask you for protection from everything evil that he has protection from in any difficulty or disease or worry that anyone is going through. We ask that you remove it and that you cure it. And that you give ease, Ya Rabbi Alameen, to us and to the Muslimin. And sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa barak 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 wa